Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradi, and here at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, where we're talking to Jackie Snyder, who is uh, an assistant professor here specializing in cyber and autonomous uh, systems, a PhD from George Washington University, my uh, alma mater. And uh, there is a disclaimer here that the views you express are your own, and you're not speaking on behalf of the uh, Naval War College. Jackie, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much. I wanted to start off with um, talk, asking you about the cyber challenge. Everybody um, is talking about the Internet of Things, uh, how cyber vulnerabilities um, can, uh, you know, at what point do cyber vulnerabilities and cyber actions transition into kinetic? I know you've done work on that. Um, but first, what's the cyber challenge that faces the Navy? Because you have ships like the USS Zumwalt, highly sophisticated uh, itself, an Internet of Things, very, very sophisticated warship that's very cyber dependent. Um, what are the cyber vulnerabilities that face the Navy, given that it has these sort of major platforms that are out there, each one of which are highly dependent on computer systems to, to run and, and function and fight successfully? Yeah, you know, a lot of people have looked at um, the role that cyber operations might be able to play in creating physical effects. Can I physically destroy the Zumwalt? But I think what's actually more likely to happen and per perhaps more insidious and more dangerous is the degradation of trust in our data. Um, the way we operate, the way we execute military power is um, highly dependent on data and being able to trust that data. And if there's one thing that we've seen that cyber operations can do, it's to degrade our ability to believe information. And if we don't believe information, then it's not just that the Zumwalt stops physically operating. It's that you can't execute operations, you can't believe in the battle damage assessment, you can't um, create strategic effects. And I think that's actually the most dangerous threat to Navy operations, is the inability to trust the data that we've built our weapon systems, our operations, and our strategies on. And, and what are the best ways to defend those networks? Because uh, if you look at it, there are a multiplicity of potential vulnerabilities, right? I mean, we saw from Stuxnet, uh, or, or even in experiments, I mean, I remember friends of mine at Sun saying, we tell everybody, don't take the USB stick and plug it into your computer. It's very, very bad. And then they deliberately leave a USB stick in the coffee room and somebody plugs it into their computer, yeah. right? And that's at Sun, or, or well, now Sun doesn't exist anymore, so that like already dates me as an old timer. But you know, what are some ways to protect that vulnerability? What's the right course to do that, given that the, the Navy cyber ecosystem is a gigantic one? Well, the best way is to go analog to go back to compasses and pieces of paper. But that's a huge trade-off for our military effectiveness and capability. So I think it's actually, um, there's some machine work that we can do in defense, but I think a lot of it's based on resiliency and building systems and people that are able to operate when systems are degraded. And so instead of having, you know, the system works or it doesn't work, um, creating systems and capabilities and people that can have a graceful degradation um, when there are threats to the information. And, and people who have the judgment, the skills, and the knowledge right. to be able to tell what's right. good data and what's bad right. data. Which means you have to understand the operating system that's operating underneath the application. You know, nowadays we build applications that are um, optimized for user interface. And so I can take my two-year-old and put it in front of an iPad and they know how to operate it. But because of that, sometimes we don't understand the assumptions and the technology that go behind that interface. And I think we need to build people who are able to understand what logics and what capabilities are underneath that outside interface. Do, um, you've done work on the fine or interesting line between at what point does a cyber assault then transition or should trigger a kinetic reaction? Yeah. Uh, folks have been debating this for a long time, whether the United States has to have a declaratory mm -hmm. statement, and we've made certain declaratory statements regarding that, with enough ambiguity to cause any adversary a certain pause. You've done work on this. Talk to us in so far as you can, because I know some of it is highly classified, but what are these lines? Because it is, you could argue that when it comes to cyberspace, the great power competition has transitioned to just competition, but actually affects. Talk to us a little bit about what that line is and what the state of the thinking is 
at what point do you transition and respond to a cyber or potentially overwhelming or even devastating cyber attack and respond to that with a kinetic effect? Yeah, this is fascinating. Um, and a lot of this is in the realm of the hypothetical. And so we actually have some of the world-class capabilities to thunder, understand the hypothetical here, and that's wargaming. So a lot of my research is in designing or analyzing war games to understand the role that cyber operations play in crises. And I went back and I, um, I actually did some declassification of games that we had run over six years, and what I found was that over six years, cyber operations never created an escalatory dynamic. In hmm. fact, even when the red team conducted really highly escalatory cyber operations, including cyber attacks that created nuclear effects on allied countries, uh, the, our blue team players chose not to respond to those cyber operations. They said, well, it's psychologically different. And so this interesting thing that I found, the cyber restraint, I thought, well, is, is this just happening within elites? And so um, with a professor at Cornell, Sarah Kreps, we ran a series of survey experiments to understand, does the domestic opinion, do they have the same sort of cyber restraint? And we found that once again, the U.S. population is not, uh, does not consider cyber attacks, even when, when they create the same effects as a nuclear or a conventional attack, they don't consider them to be the same. And so there's this cyber fire break in which cyber operations can operate underneath armed conflict, underneath the gray zone, um, and not yet not escalate beyond. So um, the next follow-on to this research is to look at the role that um, vulnerabilities within nuclear command and control might play, uh, because there are hypotheses that potentially that vulnerability would create the incentives for escalation. So we're at the beginning part of that project and running it um, in the United States and also with um, foreign um, different countries to see what potential role cyber vulnerabilities in nuclear command and control might play in crisis dynamics. Uh, do you know how our potential adversaries do respond? So for example, from a Chinese or a Russian perspective, or, well, I don't think a North Korean perspective really would be a valid uh, question, but from a Chinese and a Russian perspective, do Chinese and Russians look at this and say, no, 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 you know, that's not a line, that's not a Rubicon we should cross, or is their answer, sure? I mean, that's the $100 million question. Uh, there is good research being done on this um, by a woman named Fiona Cunningham at at MIT on the China question, and people are looking at the Russia question as well. Uh, I can't say with any authority, but I can say that if, if what I'm finding in my American sample are not American reactions, but instead human reactions to the uncertainty and the virtuality of the cyber threat, then we might be able to say something more generally about the role that cyber operations would play across cultures. But I don't know yet, so that's a, a research question for us. Um, speaking of uh, cultures and cyber, uh, one of the tough challenges that um, that has engendered a lot of debate and discussion in the military uh, that sort of changing in the last administration was hiring and retaining a generation of cyber talent that may have blue hairs, hair or hairs, no hair, uh, or man buns or yeah. ponytails or facial hair or personal grooming standards that we may not, uh, not, not to say that that's a thing, but let's just hypothetically say it is a thing and paint a horrible stereotype. But how do you, what are some, way, you know, you've been looking at this issue, what are some ways the Navy and the DOD uh, and the U.S. government writ large can harness, attract folks who are on a different wavelength than folks who are in uniform historically and classically uh, may have prefer to use certain substances that people in the military might not want to use, uh, but are extremely gifted in cyber, cyber skills, cyber tradecraft, hacking, uh, whether white, gray, or black, should that be valuable. Talk to us about what are some ways that the, the service can harness this pool um, without, you know, how, 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 what's the right way to do that? Yeah, you know, people talk a lot about the AI arms race. Um, and even if you um, take the metro into the Pentagon in DC, there's these pictures of hardware and like, this is the future. But in reality, all these technologies, the future, the arms race is in talent development. And so you see that this technological talent race is happening in Silicon Valley, for example, where they're paying just millions of dollars for top thinkers and in artificial intelligence to be attracted into these various companies. Now, the Department of Defense is not going to pay somebody a million dollars to work on artificial intelligence, and especially, you know, as an armed combatant. 
Um, so we're not going to attract people with giving them the most money. Um, but we can do institutional changes, and I think a lot of the services, um, the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, are thinking about how can we recruit these people where they don't have to fill the box in the normal institutional way. So can they skip basic? Um, can we bring them in kind of the way we do with medical officers or legal officers where they come in as uh, you know, an O3, for example? And I think these are all really good um, institutional changes. They're also looking more at how you can leverage the reserve and the guard and using people who are using the part-time force um, in order to augment that talent arms race. But in reality, and part of the work I've done is that we can change these institutional things, but if we still kind of have these cultural divides and a cultural understanding of what a warfighter is, and that the warfighter is somebody who has short hair, who has a certain physique, and then we might be needlessly leaving people out of the mix that would be really fantastic assets. And I question, or I, I urge people to question the assumptions behind what is a warfighter, and see what about this is about our civil military divide? What about this is um, our cultural idea of what a military member looks like and what are actually kind of representations of what the future mission will be. Because quite often when we talk about the future force, we talk about this behind me. We talk about machines. And in reality, we need to think about what are the future missions and the people that need to be uh, manning those missions. Because maybe it doesn't matter what color their hair is. And maybe physical requirements are not as important for some of the missions that we're going to have in the future. So just taking the, the future force the other step. Uh, thank you for giving a uh, better answer because I vapor locked because part of that end of it was going to be the cultural divide because military folks have who have gone through you know the pipeline have a tendency of having some disdain aimed at those who did not come through that pipeline. You know wh how is it this guy all of a sudden is is a lieutenant commander? You know I, I had to work for twelve or fourteen years to become a lieutenant commander. You know how how what are some things that the Navy what are some things Navy leadership has to do? to try to open the aperture, or do you think that that's pushing on an open door where there are folks in the force who understand there's a huge amount of talent out there that the service has to harness, and so we should be more flexible? Yeah, and this comes back to this conception of what is discipline and what creates discipline. I think in a, um, we have proxied certain physical behaviors with discipline marching, for example, um, or the ability to conduct a two-mile run in a certain pace or conduct do the right amount of push-ups. Um, I'm not convinced that those are the right proxies for discipline. Um, I was in the active duty in the Air Force, and I was in charge of individuals who were, you know, techie and geeky. And I, we had a problem with fitness, but they were great at the mission. They weren't necessarily not disciplined. They just weren't disciplined at those particular facets. And so I know there are people out there who are studying this and who, try, who can understand how you create unit cohesion and how you create discipline. Um, and I think that it might be interesting to look beyond fitness and see, well, are there other means of creating a team or creating a willingness to complete a mission that have nothing to do with fitness? Just interesting. It's questioning the assumption. Um, I'm a social scientist. I like to have data. I don't have data on this, but I think that if we continue to look for data, we could um, better look at what we need for recruitment. As long as it's good data. Uh, that goes um, saying. Yeah, that's right. You don't want to have corrupted Chinese data uh, being presented <laughs> to you. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry about that. Um, l let me ask on autonomy. You also have done um, a lot of thinking on, on autonomy. Um, and there are the debate, uh, even though you think it should be settled given technological progress, uh, what our potential adversaries will do, there's still a lot of debate about particularly among you know, Western nations uh, and Western scientists. Uh, you saw the letter to the United Nations yeah. about, look, there should be international standards that prohibit autonomous, we purely autonomous weapons. And, and yet, if you look at the literature from any of our potential competitors, there is a very high comfort level of deploying weapons that use very, very simple tautologies. Its signature is not mine, ergo, it, that is a legitimate target. Talk to us about the work you're doing, the thinking you're doing, and how not just the Navy but the international community needs to think about what an autonomous battlefield looks like in the future, because whether anybody likes it or not, 
it's someplace that we're going. Yeah, and I think here we sometimes revert too much to sci sci-fi and tropes instead of thinking about it in a really rigorous way. And I would recommend, for example, Paul Schar's book, The Army of None, was a really good primer for somebody trying to disaggregate the sci-fi um, from the reality. And the reality is, the autonomy boat has already sailed. Um, our weapon systems already have active seeker heads. Um, and so in, uh, we still fire them. They don't have firing authority. But more and more often, the, the weapons of the future have some sort of logic or ability to discriminate between the target and between friendlies, to um, launch without lock, which is um, something that's kind of been in our inventory starting since the advent of the microprocessor. So in some way, the autonomy d thing is already left the gate. The question is kind of how much authority, how much ability we want to delegate to machines to be able to take that fire, um, that firing decision. And that's a really complicated question because there's a question of military effectiveness and what the technology can actually do. There's a question of ethics and what is ethical. And then there's a question of truly like what are we comfortable with delegating to the machine, which is more of an emotional, cognitive trust element. I focus my research a lot on that emotional reaction between the warfighter and the autonomous weapon. Um, and so all three of those things come into play into decisions about what types of weapons we should be investing in. Um, and sometimes the sometimes being most effective on the battlefield can actually solve some of the ethical problems. Um, and that's why sometimes scientists maybe don't understand some of the, um, what actually works, what doesn't, what the considerations are on the battlefield. So if you go back to the nuclear um, analogy, for example, the strongest um, initial descent to nuclear weapons was actually from the nuclear scientist community. So these are all groups of people that need to come together and understand and start speaking the same language. Well, and Albert Einstein, in fact, right, was one of the strongest yes. voices yeah. uh, arguing uh, against and, and wanting to put it as a world weapon, not, not, as a, not as a U.S. weapon. Even though you're not a military ethicist, I want to ask you the ethics question of it. Throughout, throughout the history of warfare, there have been debate about, you know, whether, you know, longbowmen were ethical because knights should fight each other with, with swords or the introduction of the crossbow or the firearm. Uh, and then if you go you know, civilians shouldn't be targeted, and then we ended up in the First World War targeting civilians. Uh, or you could argue even in the American Civil War, right, where the march mm -hmm. it was Germany. targeting civilians, the march to the sea, uh, or nuclear weapons. You know, talk to us a little bit about the evolution of thinking when it comes to operational effects. You know, submarines were underhanded yeah. weapon, yeah. and now they're, uh, they're well, hold a unique place in military capability, particularly in great power competition, yeah. right? So I think part of this is the feeling that if you are mitigating the risk to a human being, that somehow this will induce a state or an individual to, to fire or to take someone else's life when they wouldn't otherwise, right? So with the longbowmen, you're increasing the distance, the range of, of conflict, and that therefore decreases the, um, the first contact. And that's unethical. Um, but what I have found, because I, with a co-author, Dr. Julian McDonald at the University of Denver, we've been looking at the unmanned imperative and the drive for unmanned technologies. And we went back and looked at military revolutions over time, and we found is that there have been times when states have tried to create that distance from the battlefield with technology. But what actually creates these large incentives for military changes a military revolution is not distance in itself, but it's the combination of distance with um, firepower. And so states aren't necessarily more likely to invade another country just because they can fire first. They have to also have better lethality when they fire first. And so it's not the firing first that creates the large revolutionary incentive, but instead it's firing first for effects. So if you look at the technology that we're developing now, we're not necessarily looking at technologies that are pairing large-scale lethality, like a nuclear weapon, with also these big changes in autonomy. In fact, when we talk about autonomy and nuclear weapons, we all get very, very nervous. So what's fascinating is we know that over time, it's not range by itself that creates incentives for revolutionary change. And what should we be investing in um, as the US Department of Defense? 
And so this is where Julia and I have a theory of the use of autonomous vehicles. And that is that if you're in a war of coercion, which is a smaller, limited range war, you have a very limited objective, that you should be investing in autonomous weapons that maximize um, mitigating political cost. So they might be very expensive weapons, but they take the man out in a way that allows you to get in, get fast, get out fast, and achieve a very small objective. But that if you are doing a larger scale, more existential conflict, for example, a peer-on-peer -peer conflict, then what you want to invest in is not things that mitigate political costs, because you've already kind of gotten rid of political costs at that point, but instead invest in autonomy that mitigates economic costs. So you're talking very smaller um, systems that can be shot down, that are missile soakers, that can um, create big data um, ISR networks. So those are two very different types of weapon systems that you would invest in that have autonomous characteristics. Um, and so hopefully that's kind of where this discussion about the unmanned imperative goes in the future. Uh -huh. y you know, it was uh, f uh, fascinating. Just, you know, everybody has a particular concern about nuclear weapons, justifiably so. On the other hand, if you look at firebombing, more people died of firebombings than they did yeah. from either of the two nuclear weapons that were used. And, uh, and uh, G uh, General uh, Chilton, uh, former uh, Strategic Command commander, also a former astronaut, always points out if you want to know what war what what war without nuclear weapons looks like just look at world war ii in terms of of the carnage because it was unchecked in 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 some respects let me let me take you because our time is short uh the last question is what are the kinds of autonomous systems you know as you've studied the ethics studied the need former airmen uh or airmen for life uh just shout out there for for larry spencer oh and another shout out uh, our very own jennifer lee oprah hori who is our digital director is the one who came up with the title for paul's name army of none oh, so wonderful. so uh she uh, she she did that and and we're we're very lucky to have her on 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 the team um talk to us a little bit about the systems what is the kind of autonomy the navy and the nation needs as yeah. you look at you know, the submariners will say it's for dangerous, dirty, and dull work, right? Which is why we want the ultra large, uh, uh, ultra large on demand underwater vehicles. What do you think are some of those systems that are going to be particularly attractive uh, when it comes to the employment of autonomy or, or to be employed yeah. autonomously? So I think it definitely goes back to this idea of the trade-off between political costs and economic costs, and that we need to invest in weapon systems for different types of conflict. I think there are mission sets that have proven themselves to be highly advantageous for autonomy. Um, for example, we're going to live in a degraded C2 environment, using unmanned systems to serve as a relay lake so that you can have more organic command and control instead of having to rely on satellites or really expensive over the horizon resources. That's a really good use for unmanned systems. Also, unmanned systems that can act as kind of missile soakers that increase the economic costs, that degrade uh, missile inventories, for example, is a really good use of unmanned systems. And then I think that one of the most contested regions in the future for the Navy will be the underwater region. Because of the advent of big data, um, I think it will be much more likely that we will have um, more contestation occurring underneath the water. And in that case, autonomous, completely autonomous vehicles become something that we might have to think about because of the physical limitations of transmitting information under the sea. Um, and so we might find that, for example, you have um, cables under the water and you have a series of kind of machines that are duking it out amongst each other to defend that cable. Um, so that's the type of kind of physical plus theoretical dynamics that could lead to investing in the right weapons for autonomy. Uh, which, uh, you know, shows Bob Ballard was talking about that 25 years ago. I just <laughs> want to point out that, you know, when you were asking about what the future of warfare is, he was like the bottom of the ocean. And I thought that that was a tremendous thing to say sort of 25, uh, 25 years ago. Uh, Jackie Snyder, uh, associate professor here at the United States uh, Naval War College, uh, expert on autonomy as well as cyber. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. It was wonderful talking about it.